What was your initial reaction to Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor? Hey, friendo, Steve here. Hey, Larson. And you're watching Tom Talks Rubbish. What's going on, guys? It's your boy, Tom Talk Trush, and today I'm back for another interview. This time, I'm joined by Kyle Sparks from the Code of Honor podcast on Bodyslam.net. So welcome to the show, Kyle. Hey, thanks for having me. It's, um, it's a little bit, a little bit odd to me that uh, there's an interest in people wanting to talk to me, but here we are. Nah, I've seen your show and you do very good work, my friend. So you should be very proud. Well, thank you. I, uh, I've, I've greatly enjoyed it. It's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. So if we take this back, where does Kyle first discover wrestling? Well, I, um, I'm going to date myself a bit because uh, I'm just on the doorstep of my 40th birthday. So I was absolutely a little Hulkamaniac uh, okay. growing up in the States here. And uh so I grew up in the in the mid to late '80s, sort of as as the, the rock and wrestling boom was was in full swing, and uh, we didn't have a lot of money, so we I didn't get a chance to see a lot of the pay per views, you know, as they happened. I was kind of reliant on either uh, video rentals or uh, friends of my dad's who would tape stuff and let him borrow it, and I would get a chance to check it out or things like that. But, uh, that was really the start of it. Um, I just kind of fell in love with the art form and it's been an, an ongoing affair for close to 40 years now. So was your dad a wrestling fan? Because you talked about his friends letting him borrow stuff. Was he a wrestling fan as well? Somewhat. Uh, he would probably fit into the into the casual fan uh, motif. He wasn't really a every week kind of thing, but he sort of sort of knew who was who and what was what, but wasn't a really big dedicated fan, I would say. So how did you actually first discover the 80s and Hulkamania and wrestling in general? Then Just found it on TV, just came across it on TV one day and I was like, I what is this? These guys look like superheroes in real life. And like, I, I was flabbergasted. I, the, the WWE, uh, WWF then uh, really speaks to that level of uh, these guys are larger than life. These guys are bigger, bigger and more bombastic. And that is going to catch a younger person's eye. It's almost, uh, to put it in a comics sort of metaphor, it's almost DC versus Marvel. Yeah, yeah. Whereas Marvel's heroes were much young, were more grounded in reality and the sort of day-to-day -day problem sort of like inspired by Stan Lee. Whereas the DC heroes in, that, in their uh, cavalcade were almost gods on earth of just big and loud and powerful and... So it, there's a very WWE, uh, NWA parallel there. but I get what you mean, though. But since you're such a fan of work right now with your work of Ring of Honor, when did that transition start happening? Uh, probably, probably right around, uh, once, once, around when I graduated high school and started to get into college. Um, I was aware of other promotions, obviously, you know, I was in high school during the boom period of the NWO. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but at that point that was almost, uh, in some ways that felt a little bit like two sides of the same coin. Cause they were, they were doing similar things. Both of them were trying to go with that crash TV kind of mentality, but WCW did offer the cruiserweight program and all of that. That was just 
mind blowing for a young fan in North America. Um, but I had, and I may still to this day have, if I had a VHS player that still worked, um, I, a tape of the Ricky Steamboat versus Ric Flair, two out of three falls from Clash 6 in New Orleans at the Superdome. And that always stuck out to me. Even even when I was younger and didn't grasp what good work and work rate and everything else was, that stood out even in, even then and said, "This is special. These are two guys who are so so good at this." And as I got into college, uh, I leaned more heavily into the older NWA stuff. Uh, I liked some of the cruiserweight stuff that I could find, uh, and. A couple of years into college, a small, a small independent promotion started out of Philadelphia named Ring of Honor. Mm-hmm. So, and then in this time, how much, when Ring of Honor is first born, shall we say, how much are you consuming? As much as I could get my hands on. I mean, as a college student, I was, I was not exactly flush with cash. Nope. I, I, I could not pick up all the new uh, releases as they came out, but uh, I tried to keep tabs on it as best I could. I tried to, I stayed pretty active in the forums. I was uh, aware of that. I was buying new shows when I could. Um, I kind of relied on different things like in the forums at one point they would, uh, they'd, there were people that would develop threads based on, we won't spoil the results, but we'll give you approximate ratings of the matches kind of thing mm-hmm. where it's like, yeah, yeah. we'll tell you who won, but this is like a four star match kind of deal. And, you know, I would use that to dictate some of my buying, but in other cases, it was just whenever I could get, get my hands on it. Um, Cause it was still VHS at that point for our weeks. They didn't really shift yeah. to DVD format for a little bit yet. So, and this might sound like a very strange question, but if you were to discover the Ring of Honor wrestling and the work rate, work, work, yeah, work rate wrestling, that is very hard to say. Uh, at the AZ, yes. you discovered Hulkamania and vice versa. Do you think you would develop a passion for both as much as you did? Hope that question made sense. No, that is an interesting question. I see where you're going with it. Um, no, I, I, I think I see where you're going with it. But, you know, my, ex- my early exposure was to more uh, uh, Hulkamania style uh, flash and trash, as I heard it put before. <laughs> um, uh, and it, that uh, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're more like if I was exposed to that type of work rate uh, in the 80s when I first discovered wrestling, would I be a bit as big a fan of it? Yeah, well, uh, basically, if you discovered Ring of Honor in the 80s, would you be a bigger fan of it? I think so. Um, I I was still a big Hulkamaniac, but um, I really enjoyed watching Randy Savage. I couldn't put my finger on why. I don't know if it was just that his presentation was so much different or if what he brought to the ring was, was different than Hogan, but he was definitely somebody that, that, that caught my eye. And um, I, 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 I can't... Uh, I could try and and BS you and claim that I, I always believed in Bret Hart and was always a fan right from the from the first time I saw him. But you know, I, I did enjoy his stuff, but he wasn't ever a guy that struck me as my favorite until I got a little bit older and realized, oh, this guy is really really good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> this guy so, is excellent at pro wrestling. <laughs> fair enough. So before we go into your work with Body Slam, have you had like a lull where? You've mm-hmm. just sort of had moments where it was like, I don't have time to watch wrestling or maybe something happened in wrestling that you were like, okay, I'm going to put you to the side for a while. Um, actually, uh, before, I, um, before I got into Ring of Honor in college, so this would have been my early 20s or so, um, about 2000 to 2002 or three kind of era. Uh, I had kind of stepped away from uh, 
WWE at that point, just because I, I wasn't that entertained by it anymore. Um, I wasn't, I didn't really have a lot of time to watch it while, while I was you know, studying for classes and things. And it just didn't catch my eye the way it used to. Um, so there was definitely a lull there and ROH definitely brought me back into mm-hmm. the fandom. Um, more recently, I would probably have to say uh, I've got two kids. So that definitely, uh, they're my priority. A hundred percent, you know, and uh, that there have definitely been times where, you know what? I don't really feel like watching this show tonight because I'd rather play with the kids. <laughs> Fair and, enough. <laughs> so if uh, obviously your family is your priority, what is like your priority for wrestling? nowadays what's the show that you even if you weren't in the media were like okay once the kids are in bed i'm gonna make time and sit and watch this uh aew is viewing for me now um in general i might try to catch wwe occasionally uh, I got. I do have to admit that I'm just not as big a fan of what the product is doing right now. Mm-hmm. Um, NXT, the black and gold NXT, used to be appointment viewing for me, but um, I just can't find a lot in WWE, current WWE, to get excited about. Whereas AEW's appointment viewing, uh, NJPW, I try to keep up on, but I definitely can't do that live because uh, that's. Uh, very, very early the in t- the morning, if I understand timetables, right? Um, it is. Usually an eight, Usually, a New Japan show, uh, if it's streaming live on uh, New Japan World, will be going live for me at about 4 o'clock in the morning. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you can empathize with that, with uh, the way that the United States has sort of monopolized the wrestling, the national wrestling landscape, and if you want to watch a U.S. promotion and over where you're at, then well, it's very early you. in the morning normally. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it's about time that I, as an American fan, got a little taste of that too. I suppose. I I joke. Me and Cass have this joke all the time, like when he has to cover a New Japan show because literally no other staff are available. I'm like, welcome to my world, pal. Like literally, <laughs> this is a monthly occurrence. <laughs> Like, and I mean that exactly. in the nicest possible way. Oh, so of course. how did you then get involved with Body Slam? Because everyone I've spoken to from Body Slam has a very unique story of how they got in touch with Cassidy. Um, I actually uh, got in touch uh, with Cass and with Body Slam through uh, Jay Shell. Uh, okay. She was working for Body Slam at the time. She's since moved on to other opportunities because she's, you know, taken over the wrestling world. But uh, uh, she uh, she was somebody that I had uh, come across in, on Twitter and uh, happened. She happened to mention something about uh, Body Slam was looking for uh, people to do news and or features or what have you. Um, I had written a few features for Wrestle In mm-hmm. um, with Kieran and uh, and that whole crew who are all fantastic people. Uh, and I had actually covered Ring of Honor back in the HD Net days for uh, Inside Pulse, okay. so I sort of had some experience doing that as well. And I was like, you know what? Sure. I, I, I sent along a couple of my uh, my columns for Wrestle In and a couple of things, and went through a, a pretty quick application process and started uh, started turn around news for them. And so, then uh, it's grown from there. So then. How did you hang on? No, first of all, like, what was the trepidation like when you were basically waiting on this application? Was it like, eh, if this doesn't happen, I've got things to fall back on, or was it like, oh no, please work? Do you know what I mean? Uh, to be perfectly honest, I felt pretty confident about it. Um, uh, in my uh, real life career, um, <laughs> I had spent uh, almost six years working in, in news, in, in the digital end of, of, of news for, uh, mm-hmm. for news stations. So 
I had, I felt like, I, I felt like my writing was not going to be a concern. Um, so, and at that, at that point I kind of went, you know, if it, if it works great, if not, I'm still going to enjoy the shows and live tweet them and whatever else and still have a good old time. What is something you took in your background in traditional news to basically start working in the wrestling news? And then what is something you maybe left behind in traditional news and didn't take with you? Uh, probably uh, a quick Google finger. Uh, that's something that, you know, I learned, you learn to, to search and get something uh, and learn something very quickly, uh, find information very quickly. Uh, you think of, you, you, you have two or three places where you usually go uh, to get information on something uh, because in traditional news, uh, you're, you need to be, you need to become an expert in something that you might not know anything about very quickly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're going to need to explain it to people who know even less than you do, and so I I took from that the this this same idea that uh, I w- I want to be able to have uh, background information for news updates. I want to be able to contextualize uh, what I'm writing about for people, and uh, that involves looking up statistics, records, uh, dates, things like that. Um, as far as something that I might have left behind in traditional news, uh, probably that, uh, that, uh, that quotes aren't necessarily as critical for the types of updates that I need. I don't necessarily need sound bites for everything that I post. Um, you know, I, if I can get an embedded tweet or something like that, that is going generally going to be sufficient for what we need. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't, I'm not as concerned about that uh, unless, you know, we're doing a show unless and we get some breaking news out of that. Then of course we'll, we'll go from there. How about, and then how did you then pitch the Code of Honor podcast to Cassidy? Uh, Code of Honor was something that, uh, sort of grew out of me looking at the landscape and thinking, you know what? Nobody's talking about ring of honor right now. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've, we we're, we feel pretty confident that it's coming back. You know, what year was this, was this during the pandemic? It was, um, this was a, co- the, the code of honor cast launched with just within the last couple of months. Oh, really? Um, it did. It's just a couple of months old. And uh, it, I was always a fan. I still am, obviously. And uh, once it became really apparent that ROH was coming back, that this wasn't just a pipe dream, because mm-hmm. when, the, when, when the hiatus was announced, there was obviously a very real concern that, oh, they say they're going to have another show, but I, mm, I don't know if they're coming back or not. It, uh, as time went by, it became abundantly clear. Oh no, they're coming back. They're going to do this. And I, I saw uh, a hole in the landscape of, you know, nobody's talking about ROH right now. And a lot of the current landscape of professional wrestling would not exist without ROH. 100% agree. And so I brought that in um, and I, I, I knew that I wasn't experienced enough as a podcaster and certainly not as a host to do something like that on my own. Mm-hmm. So uh, it was very serendipitous that uh, I came across Kylie and uh, she and I met and, and, and hit it off very quickly. And uh, as somebody who is as big a fan or bigger than I am in ROH and uh I feel like we had great chemistry on camera from the first show. I, mm-hmm. I could not be more excited or happy for her as a co-host. I am over the moon with how well it's worked. She is absolutely one of the best that I could have ever hoped for to work with. She's great. Like she's been on my channel a couple of times and she's just a really nice person to top it off as well. Yes. And her enthusiasm is infectious too. I mean, I yeah. get infectious. I, I get, uh, I get excited about what we're talking about, but 
uh, she somehow, <laughs> she is so enthusiastic about it as well. I, I find it infectious. I feed off it as well. And I, I genuinely can't say enough good things about her or our producer, uh, Jameis as well, who, who is, uh, if you watch our show, we get little uh, pop-up video style uh, uh, messages on the lower third. Uh, he's responsible for those. Checks for okay. us. Uh, sometimes, sometimes snarky comments. Uh, makes us, gives it gives the show a little bit of personality. So I mean, it's a great team, and I'm re- I, I'm thrilled to be part of it. So if we break it down, how did you connect with Kylie? First of all. Uh, it's just somebody that I, uh, honestly, it was just, uh, she was in the, uh, body slam, uh, group chat of Fair. just, uh, we were, I was, I was, I was tinkering around, uh, with this, with this idea for, uh, for a show, as I recall it, she might recall it differently. I, mm-hmm. that's what, ha- that's what happens when you get older, your memory starts to go. It's, um, <laughs> uh, no, as, as I recall, I was, I was looking for uh, an opportunity to, to get into a show and to do something with ROH and she piped and she reached out to me and I, now I'm trying to remember if she reached out to me or I reached out to her, which, which way the communication went, but we got in touch via, via DM and, and, and uh, said, Hey, is this something that we think we can do? And yeah it took off from there do you remember Cass's initial reaction when you pitched it uh Cass I was pretty hands-off I think this was more Jameis's baby okay Uh, Cass had kind of given him the green light if it was something that he liked and thought was good um that we could roll with it um since then I know Cass has been very supportive uh he's been He's been excited with with what we've been doing. Uh, we've had a couple of great interviews with Kerry Silken. Uh, so, congrats on that, by I, the way. I, I really enjoyed that one. Thank you. He's he's a, he's a blast to talk to. Just a wonderful man. Um, but now Cass has been has been very supportive, and uh, I I hope I hope he's happy. <laughs> <laughs> what is something that you feel like you bring to Code of Honor? that Kylie doesn't and vice versa. I probably bring, uh, my role is kind of the resident historian. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy who was kind of there as it was happening in 2003 and 2004 and, uh, sort of bring those memories of what was happening back then to the table. Uh, a lot of a lot of the statistics and things like that. Um, I'm I'm looking up uh, stats and connections and factoids and trivia and things to sort of flesh out and contextualize the sh- the, the show or the events. Uh, Kylie brings a little bit more recent history. Okay. Um, where where I have not been able to see as much in the last couple of years. I, I you know. It's one of those things where I, I do my best to to see everything that I can, but um, you know sometimes sometimes you can't catch it all. Um, and and Kylie is great with uh, with more recent history that sometimes even escapes me. Like I should I should remember that stuff better than I remember stuff from twenty years ago. But apparently sometimes I don't. Uh. Fair enough. So obviously you brought up the fact that now. Ring of Honor has been purchased by AEW Tony Khan. So what yes. do you want to see Ring of Honor become under Tony Khan? What is some stuff that maybe they need to... Actually, I'll ask you that in two parts. But like, what is something yeah. you want them to keep from the old Ring of Honor? And then what is some new things you want to see under Tony Khan? Uh well, it's it's such a tricky thing. I would love to see the pure division continue to be a major focus of the show. Uh, once with uh, ROH television during the hiatus, during the empty building matches, uh, the pure division was a was a significant focus uh, mm-hmm. because that was you know there would be a couple 
sometimes one, at least one, sometimes two matches every show that were contested under pure rules. So to continue to flesh out that division and make that uh, a, a major factor going forward would be something that uh, one, I would like to see, and two, I feel like they have to do because AEW in a lot of ways has kind of uh, taken the mantle of a lot of the, the, the niches that ROH used to fill in the wrestling landscape. Mm-hmm. The, the the hot tag team wrestling, uh, the top notch workers, the you know all those things that ROH used to do better than anybody else are are, are kind of now in the purview of AEW. So that pure wrestling division can really set you apart from a business perspective as well as from an in ring uh, point of view. Um, as far as the uh, something that I'd like to see sort of left in the past. I, I'm trying to figure out the best way to phrase this, but ROH ha- has at points in its history struggled to uh, tell consistent stories across the roster or to have, have interesting characters up and down the roster. They've been able to tell stories. They've been able to, to do that. They've had epic stories uh the bj whitmer jimmy jacobs feud uh the cm punk raven feud you know these things have 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 the age of the age of the fall uh these things have been uh woven into roh's dna but there have been points in the company's history where it just felt like two white guys that are very good at are to have a match yeah, and I, I, come on, but perspective of somebody who's not familiar with what's going on. Okay, but uh, that would probably be more more characters. Give me more. Give me more. More. What was your initial reaction to Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor? I was, it, 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 it caught me out of left field. I will definitely say that. I was very surprised by it. Um, I was excited at the thought that um, this meant that uh, Honor Club would hopefully be getting some money behind it because I love Honor Club. I'm a subscriber to Honor Club. Honor Club could be so much better. <laughs> Their streaming mm-hmm. service could be so much better than it is. And this is something that Kylie and I have talked about as well, that get that money behind the streaming service because you have 20 years of content featuring almost every single top star in the world today that you own. Mm-hmm. You know, and how you, that can make you so much money. Yeah. So yeah, I was excited really- for that. Was there anything you were like, oh no, this might not go so well? I still have this concern to date, and that would be um, Tony Khan wearing too many hats. I, I had this exact discussion today at time of recording. And um, this, it, it's, you know, this is a passion project for Tony, clearly, but uh, he's taking on a lot right now. He's booking AEW. Uh, this, I don't see, you know, keep delirious on to sort of handle the book for ROH. Um, Kylie and I have talked about a number of times, back up the, uh, back up the dump truck full of money for Maria Canellis and bring her and Bobby Cruz in and let them handle the women's division. And, you know, bring in extra hands who have a proven track record of being able to, uh, know this, know this promotion, know this audience, and to deliver on it. And the, because the problem is, uh, we've had a number of episodes that we've gone into for Code of Honor Cast of. I don't know what we're going to talk about because there's no news. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's been kept very close to the vest, and Tony likes to do that. And great, that's that's a good thing objectively, but. For us trying to do a podcast, it's killing us. <laughs> give, a, 
give us something to talk about. Fair enough. So as we wrap this up, because I've just had the time come up on my thing, we're going to do a very mm. quick fire questions of something that I call generic questions. This is where uh, those of you that have seen my work before know I ask my guest pretty much every question I'm sure they get asked on Twitter on a daily basis. So now they have a place to go, look, I've answered this, go watch this. So first of all, Kyle, what's your favourite match of all time? Oh. This is the thing where I said you might be stumped on air. Yeah, Steamboat versus Flair, Clash 6. Favourite pay-per-view of all time? Their pay-per-view, uh, it's a it's a tie between Great American Bash 89 and WrestleMania X7. Favorite wrestler or superstar of all time? That can be both categories. Oh, man. So both. Okay. Um, CM Punk. Favorite uh, tag team of all time? Tag team. The Steiners. And then finally, favorite theme song of all time? F- favorite female of all time? Favorite theme song of all time. Theme song. That's As in very different. Theme. Okay. Yeah, I got a, a little audio buzz there. Um, I'm going to go with the Punk's AFI music. Is that the Ray one he Bonner. came out? Is that the one he came out to in the MJF dog collar match? Yep, that's the one. Because that was uh, ROH, the entire crowd would be banging on those metal guardrails in time with the music. And it was just, it was an experience top to bottom. Fair enough. So as we wrap this up, uh, the question I end all my interviews on is with YouTube, with podcasting, with social media in general, we're all sort of going to live forever in some sort of way. So what is one video that you're like, or podcast in your case, or even article that you're like, don't go back and look at that. I've grown a lot since then. And then what is one that you're like, if you want to know my body of work, go check that out. Um, thankfully, I feel I can't really think of one off the top of my head that I'm just woefully embarrassed by because I didn't put, I didn't commit things to video until very recently. I feel like I was smart in that aspect. Fair um, enough. <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I've got some, I've got some horrendous school pictures from back in the day, but otherwise, you know, <laughs> so does everyone. Yeah. Um, the, uh, at the to, to date, the thing that I'm most proud of is probably our most recent interview with Carrie Silken for the Code of Honor cast. Uh, it was a tremendous interview. Uh, we talked about the HDNet era of Ring of Honor. Uh, we got to talk about what I thought was a pretty underrated period in Ring of Honor's history uh, with the man who was there. Uh, I thought it was a great blend of entertainment and history and fun. And yeah, that's what I want came into this wanting to do is to produce stuff like that. So I was very excited that I was able to do it. Fair enough. So as we wrap this up, where can the good people find you? I am on Twitter at Kyle K Sparks. Uh, I am usually live tweeting uh, Rampage, Dynamite, uh, I'll occasionally be talking about dark elevation, uh, occasionally impacts, uh, I, as soon as I find a way to get all that working again, get impact plus working because I don't have access on my local cable plan. Um, <laughs> and you can follow, I, I do the code of honor cast that is at code of honor cast on Twitter. So follow that as well. That is also where we're going to have news and information on the podcast. Uh, I'm on the Code of Honor cast Mondays at 3 p.m. Uh, we did not record this weekend. I was uh, I was uh, traveling with the family, and there wasn't much news happening anyway, so it kind of worked out nicely. Um, th- those are the big things. I'm writing for Body Slam. I I I get I get guff from Jameis constantly because I'm not writing as many news reports for them anymore. Uh, this is because Corey does such a fantastic job with it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, he does he does great work getting all the news up. By the time I get out of my real job, there's not much to do. Uh, but I uh, I do have a few uh, pieces up at Russell Inn. I have a threat. I have a pin thread on my Twitter uh, where you can read some of those, including a retrospective on the Punk Joe feud, um, which was tr- which I'm I, 
I was very proud of that. It took me probably three to 5,000 words, something in that neighborhood. It's very long. Um, uh, coming up in the future, Kylie and myself will be talking, uh, we'll be uh, posting wherever we, whatever we're doing, you know, just keep an eye on our Twitter. We'll, uh, we'll keep you posted. It's well worth doing, guys. So if you guys like this video, make sure you like, share and subscribe to Tom Talk Rubbish. Follow me on Twitter at Tom Talk Rubbish. Follow Bodyslam.net for my show with Cassidy Haynes, the WrestleWatch podcast. And follow the WrestleWatch podcast on Twitter. And I will see you guys in the next one. Goodbye.